Um, so our next speaker is Jody Evans. Jody was originally hired in 1987 to move the State Historical Museum and has been the museum's registrar since 1990. She's responsible for the legal and intellectual control over, uh, of over 100,000 objects and specimens. Deeds of gift, loan agreements, database management, and day-to-day -day problem solving keep her busy. Uh, and I can speak from experience, having been one of Jody's day-to-day -day problems in the past. Uh, she's a specialist in ad hoc research and holds a BA from Luther College and MN and MA from the University of Iowa. Today, Jody will be giving us the lowdown on the absolute basics of collections management. So Jody, take it away. Okay, let's see if we can get this to work. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. You're good. Um, as, um, as Michael very nicely introduced me with my own introduction, I am <clears throat> Jody Evans, registrar with the State Historical Society of Iowa. And at last year's Preserve Iowa Summit, I spoke on the absolute basics of collections management. Those basics boil down to three main parts. Know what you have, know who gave it to you, and know where you put it. This year, I am again speaking on the absolute basics of collections management, focusing on the four phases of an object's uh, museum lifespan, acquisition, accession, cataloging, and deaccessioning. Um, let's start with acquisition. Acquisition by a museum involves three actions. Intent to donate, preferably in writing that's a donor, contact the museum and asking if the museum wants something. A written acceptance by the, of the gift by the museum after the museum has gone through its donation process, its collections management, or its um, uh, collection committee process. It issues a written acceptance of the gift. And then you also need proof of physical movement from the donor to the museum. An integral part of the accession process is the deed of gift. Deeds brings together two parts of the absolute basics. Know what you have and know who gave it to you. The deed of gift is a legal instrument that documents the transfer of ownership from one entity to another. In other words, you use a deed of gift when someone gives you something. This tells everyone that that person intended that thing to come to your museum and you accept it. A deed with its description of the materials, signature from both sides of the donation, and the dates of those signatures documents that the donor intended the museum to have those materials. All dates need to come in a condition section. This section spells out what the museum can and may do with the donated materials. Conditions allow you to manage your collection. And I'm going to read you the condition section from the State Historical Museum's Deed of Gift. The Deed of Gift for I or we affirm that we are the sole owner of all title and interest in the property listed below, excluding copyright unless specifically identified. I, we, irrevocably and unconditionally give, transfer, and assign to the State Historical Museum of Iowa by way of gift all title and interests in the associated property. The property can be used, exhibited, loaned, used for research, retained, or disposed of at the discretion of the State Historical Museum of Iowa. And that's the end of our condition statement. This section clearly indicates that the museum may keep or dispose of objects you can't keep everything, some things fall apart, and you need the ability to remove those things from your collection. Some things may fall outside your collection policy, which you all have, of course, and you need the ability to remove these materials from your collection, documented, of course. Common sense favors the use of a simple, straightforward form that is adequate for the museum's average transaction. And excuse me right here, but there's a cat on my table get down okay no document can ward off all possible donation problems and be easily understood by the average person you can rarely have both if a donation becomes less straightforward perhaps because of restrictions on exhibition or access then you need a new one-time document that can be drafted after all of these negotiations are concluded in other words a simple deed will cover most transactions if not create a new document once the deed has been signed by both parties, the museum retains the original and a copy is given to the donor for their records. This is an important step as the IRS insists that charitable donations be acknowledged in writing. Mm -hmm. Digital deed. Yeah? 
Um, we're experiencing a little bit of audio issues on our end. Um, we're going to try and do a little trouble. Here. Can you just flip your mic off and back on? We're just going to try and do a little reset, see if that'll help. Okay. Okay. Where, where should I start again? Um, wherever, wherever I interrupted you at. Um, okay. Let's go, let's go down to digital deeds. At this point, I am not a fan of sending deeds as email attachments for three reasons. One, all printers are not created equal. Uh, hold on. There we go. All printers are not created equal. What looks like a nice, neat document on my computer can print very wonkily on your computer. Two, paper deeds allow me to control the process in the interest of my museum. Paper deeds are not easily tampered with. It is harder to slip in a restriction or add more items to the deed than originally agreed upon. I'm sure that in time, these personal opinions will be overcome, but for now, I prefer paper, de I prefer paper deeds of gift. Three, digital documents can be archived, but keeping on top of access and retrieval is time consuming as digital deeds change and move. Think of where you would be if proof of ownership for your collections existed only on a crashed hard drive. Now, I wrote this a few weeks ago, and since then I have come to uh, begin to um, think about using the DocuSign program. And that's something I need to discuss with my colleagues and, and leadership at, at the State Historical Society of Iowa. It has been used in a number of museums and I'm slowly coming around to the idea of perhaps we can do a digital uh, deed of gift. If you are using paper deeds, here's a tip. I use 100% cotton rag paper for my deeds. A box of this paper can be purchased from any office supply source for about $40 and lasts for years. Regular paper can be used for deeds, but I like 100% rag for its durability. Okay, here we are at accession. This is where I come in as registrar with the State Historical Society of Iowa. This is not, <laughs> this is not sexy or glamorous work, but it is the basis for a healthy museum uh, collection and, and management. Uh, a previous colleague of mine used to describe what I do as the mulch of the museum garden. So, once a donation has been offered, accepted, and received by the museum, accessioning begins. Accessioning is the process of adding objects and materials to your collection. The document is assigned an accession number using an established system. Each object is assigned an object ID based on the accession number. The objects are cataloged and documented, and files are created. The root of this pro process is the accession number. This is essentially a transaction number which connects all aspects of the donation to each other and separates one group of collection objects from other groups. The most common accession system is a trinomial compound number separated by dots or hyphens. You can see it on the screen uh, after accession. Um, the first number is the year of the donation. There we are, right there. The second number indicates the sequence of the transaction number five, and the third number is the object number indicating the order in which the objects were processed. So in our example, 2020.5.45 indicates that something was processed into the museum collection in the year 2020. It is part of the fifth donation received that year, and it is the 45th object processed. <coughs> All documents <coughs> All documentation associated with this transaction will have the 2020.5 written on it. The identifying numbers assigned to museum objects are commonly referred to as, as accession numbers, but technically only the first two parts are the accession. When the third part is added, the number becomes an object ID. Accession numbers indicate a specific transaction and each object in the transaction has the sequence. Object ID numbers are like social security numbers with a unique number added to the transaction sequence. I use a simple ledger book to record accessioning in a running list. On each line, I record the accession number, the first two numbers assigned to the transaction, a brief description of the donation, the donor, and the date. A digital spreadsheet serves the same purpose, but I'm an analog gal, and I find accessioning, accessing the paper version much faster. That brings us to cataloging. Number three in the lifespan phase. 
Cataloging, cataloging is to describe methodically. Cataloging is frequently confused with documentation, but there are slight differences. Documentation is the information such as the who, what, and where associated with an object. It is the story of an object. Cataloging is a control system that places objects in relation to like items. Cataloging involves separating objects into groups like art, natural history, or social history, and then using categories, classifications, and taxonomies to further refine an object's description. Most collection types have relevant categories and classifications, including nomenclature for museum cataloging, the Getty, Getty Research Institute has an art and architecture thesaurus, the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections, and the National Park Service has comprehensive information and manuals online. Each of these will be list, listed in the last slide I show you. Tip. Create digital or paper worksheets to capture consistent relevant information. Include spaces for accession, object ID, description, what, it, what does it look like, its provenance or story, relevant categories and classifications, donor information, and donation information. That brings us to our last phase, which is deaccessioning. I've always said that deaccessioning should be more difficult. Deaccessioning is taking something out of the permanent museum collection, and this should always be more difficult than bringing something in. While one of the more controversial aspects of museum work, deaccessioning is crucial to managing museum collections. Every mu museum should have a written deaccession policy that spells out why and how an object will be removed from the collection. Deaccessioning should not be undertaken lightly. It should be more difficult to take something out of the collection than to add something, as I said before. Objects are removed from the permanent collection for many reasons, the most prevalent being deterioration and falling outside the scope of collecting. There is much debate regarding how proceeds from deaccessioning can be used. It's an incredibly complex and nuanced part of museum work. Up until April of this year, most people agreed that deaccessioning should be used to strengthen the collection, not as a means to generate income for the museum. However, with the economic impact of COVID-19 undermining the finances of many museums, the deaccession de discussion may be changing. Stay tuned. In conclusion, these four phases represent an object's lifespan in a museum setting. Outlining how your museum will act in each phase is an integral part of your collection policy. Thoughtful attention to each phase results in clear and transparent relevance in your communities. It has been, it has been my intent to introduce these phases in an approachable manner. I invite each of you to consult the resources listed. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. If I am unable to answer, your, answer you directly, I will at least point you in the right direction. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Jody. That was uh, some really interesting information. Um, if you want to stop your screen share and uh, turn your mic and camera on, uh, we do have a few questions that have come in, and I also have a few of my own, if there is time. Okay. Uh, let me find the questions. Can you hear me, Mike? I can hear you at least, okay, so we can, we, can get, we can get rolling. Okay. Um, <laughs> What, uh, what tips do you have for accession and cataloging of digital files, like local videos of old parades, uh, National Register nominations and photos, research of local historical building or historic buildings and activities? So uh, advice for accession and cataloging of those digital files. Um, unfortunately, I have not encountered that personally in my work yet. And um, mostly, I believe, the expertise for that will lie in our state archives and special collections because they are more um, ahead of that game than the actual museum collection at this time. So Becky Plunkett, who was mentioned earlier by Susan, um, or contact me and I will, I will get you to the right people who, who can address that type of um, collection management. 
Great, thank you. Uh, in, in her last session, Susan mentioned our website, which is iowaculture.gov. Uh, if you go to that website, there's a contact us section like most websites have. Uh, all, of the, all of the State Historical Society folks are listed there and kind of what their specialty is. So for, uh, for Jody or Susan or, or later Jessica uh, or anyone you hear mentioned, if you're looking for their contact info, uh, that's a good way to find it. Uh, a couple back-to-back uh, -back questions that are so related, I, I think these two uh, viewers uh, kind of uh, worked in connection to ask them. So I'll ask it as a two-part question. Uh, what cataloging software program uh, does the State Historical Society use? And also, what's your opinion of uh, Past Perfect and other off-the-shelf collections management software packages? I think Past Perfect is great. Um, we used, the State Museum used Past Perfect from 2010 until 2018, 19. Um, and it worked fine for us. It works great. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with Past Perfect's ability to manage museum collections. Now, in 2018, we went to a more robust system called Manisys. Uh, as Susan mentioned in her earlier presentation, we are trying to integrate all collection information into one single search entity. And Past Perfect could not do that because we have so much information and we needed more bells and whistles than Past Perfect has simply to integrate. Uh, particularly, Manisys can handle library cataloging and OCLC and, and um, some things in that realm that Past Perfect is not capable of, of handling. That's not a knock on Past Perfect, it's just that we needed more. So, Past Perfect is great. I, uh, if you want to manage your collections, look into it. Um, I think the Iowa Museum Association has a, uh, a program where you can get a percentage off on the price. So it, it might work for you. Great. Uh, question, uh, could you post your condition statement? Uh, or make that available. Oh, yeah. Um, I can. I'm not sure how right now, but we will make sure that that gets into my um, slide deck. I, I believe, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, I believe copies of PowerPoint presentations from the summit are going to be available in some fashion, so it could be included in that package. I hope, I, hope I'm not making more work for someone there. If, uh, if it next. isn't, email me and I will send it to you, all of you. I'll, I'll do that. Great. Uh, another question, does Iowa have an oral history archive? We do, but again, it's not part of the museum. It is part of the um, uh, library and special collections working unit. Um, again, poor Becky Plunkett, uh, contact her and she will point you in the right direction or contact me and I'll point you in the right direction. That's great. So. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, so if anyone uh, from our viewership has any additional, uh, now's the time to get them in. But, but Jody, I was wondering, you know, you talked about um, the cataloging uh, process, uh, categorizing and, and classifications. Do you ever, um, I can't think of a better analogy, but are you ever painted into a corner and, and not know how to, how to catalog or classify an object? Or uh, are, the, are the kind of professional standards such that it makes it a very easy kind of flow chart to navigate? Uh, yes. Um, whenever you have a, a, a codified set of rules for identifying something, there's always going to be something that falls outside those rules and you have to use your best judgment on where to put it. Um, in my, in, in past life working, before we had past perfect, I used a simple um, Microsoft Access table database to have a digital representation of our collection information and in that i could choose wherever i want whatever category i wanted to put something in for instance political political materials t-shirts from um, political candidates technically they should be clothing but i wanted to find them as part of the political collection so i categorized them as political materials when we went to Past Perfect, I couldn't do that because Past Perfect had a built-in uh, classification system and you had to 
you had to follow those rules. Um, same thing with the system we're using now, Monisis. There are two built-in classifications, nomenclature and the Getty thesaurus. We can call something anything we want, but it will be classified under the rules of those two systems. It's not, my aversion to authority makes me bulk at that a little bit, but those are the rules I have to play by. Oh, that's, that's great, thank you. Um, uh, and then uh, two more questions. Um, someone asked if you could share your email address, please. Um, sure, it's, it's um, Jody, J-O-D-I dot Evans, E-V-A-N-S at Iowa dot gov. Very good. And then the final question comes from me, and it's just because I'm curious. Um, of the objects that have come across your desk uh, in your tenure with the State Historical Society, the ones that you have accessioned into the collection, do you have a favorite and what is it? Oh, golly. Um, it's okay to say no. They're all uh, your children. Uh, yes. I can't, I can't think of anything that I've accessioned. Nothing springs to mind immediately in that, that I have accessioned. But my absolute favorite object in the collection are the Andrew Clemens sand paintings, which uh, we have an online catalog. So if anyone wants to see them, go to the DCA website and um, under museum, there is an online catalog. Type in Andrew Clemens or sand paintings and it will take you to images of those fantastic pieces. Very good. Well, that's great, Jody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was some great information shared and, and some great questions from the audience. So thanks to all of you as well. Um, I think we will move on to the final speaker. Uh, so if you, Jody, want to uh, mute your video and your microphone. Okay, mute my video. Or stop video. While you do that, a, a question came through, just a, a general question uh, about the, the local history network, uh, how one would join or how an organization would join and, and how they'll receive information. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to that real briefly um, and then I'll share a link in, in the chat section um, a, a little bit later. Uh, if you go to iowaculture.gov um, and, and navigate to the State Historical Society section, the local history network is in there. Instructions uh, are how, uh, on how to join are in that web page. Uh, you'll receive uh, a quarterly email or a quarterly email newsletter uh, and then regular Facebook updates uh, from us. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's a great way for uh, information and resources to, to flow um, around the state. 